Good morning. Back in the 80s, when I was a young teenager, early 80s, I was a young teenager, I went to a great church here in Brownsville, and, and the church had a really uh, sincere desire uh, that people on the streets, that people in the city uh, would come to know Jesus, have a relationship with Jesus, would be what we call a Christ follower, would submit their lives to Jesus, and then therefore would, would know, know what eternity holds for them. It's a pretty basic question that we ask in the quiet moments of our lives, right? What does eternity hold for me? So this church was, was, uh, was really committed to that, and so we had Tuesday nights committed, uh, that, were, that were allotted, uh, that were devoted uh, to that end. And so here's where it gets a little weird. Uh, so on Tuesday nights, I, I, I got into this pattern and I only say weird because it's awkward, not weird because there's anything wrong with it, but I got into this pattern, and if you grew up in maybe a church like I grew up in, you, you may have gotten, you may, you may know what I'm talking about, but I got this pattern of you would go to a stranger, you'd find a stranger, maybe in a laundromat, maybe uh, in the lobby of the apartment complex, Maybe you went to visit someone who had visited the church on Sunday morning, but you happened to actually get their brother at the door, so, you know, willing victim. You, you, would, you, would, you would go, and you would, and you would talk to them for a few minutes, and then ultimately, in about, in about seven minutes, you would get to this question. Now, let me ask you a question. If you were to die, and I certainly hope you don't, but if you were to die, and you were to stand before God, and he asked you, why should I let you into my heaven? Uh, what would you say? Now, talk about like going from, from zero to a thousand percent in seven minutes, right? Now, I would, not, I would suggest you don't do that to your friends. Uh, maybe it worked in the 80s. It's not going to work, I don't really think now. Uh, don't, I, in fact, I never did that to my friends. I never subjected them to that. But these strangers on the street, I would do that. And if that was one of you, I apologize. If, you, if, you, if it was, if it, <laughs> glad you're in church. I'm glad, glad you didn't give up on church as a result of that. And again, it was very well meaning. It was a very sincere desire on the part of me and others to see people come to know Jesus. But what struck me, what struck me was I would always, always, always get the same answer. And the answer, I'm just going gonna, gonna, gonna to give you the key to the test, uh, the, 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 the answer key to the test right now. The, the, this is not the right answer, okay? Not according to the Bible. Not according to orthodox theology. What, what I was told time and time again is not a biblical answer. It, you certainly, it's your prerogative to believe what you choose to believe. But if you'd be like, I'm, I'm a, if, you, if, you'd be, if you would say, I, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a Bible-believing person, then, then thankfully this answer is not, it's not out of, out of scriptures. But did you hear what they say? They would say, you know, get out of my house. Uh, that's, the first, that's, some, that's what they'd say sometimes. But then they would say, they would, they would say, you know, wow, like, I, 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 try to, I try to be a good person. So, some, at some point, there's this obli- obligatory, you know, I've never killed anybody. And, oh, by the way, if you've killed somebody, there's still a place for you in heaven. Like, you could still be a child of God and spend eternity in heaven. That doesn't. It doesn't disqualify you. But they would say, like, I, 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 uh, I hope that one day I get into heaven. I, I, say that, I, I hope that, and here's, here's, the, here's what they would always, always say. And I say this, I, I tell you this because you, this may be your answer. And if so, I want you to listen super close today, super closely today. They, they would say, I hope one day when I die, the, the, the good that I've done outweighs the bad that I've done. And I would, I would be yet again surprised that, wow, this is really what people on the street believe. And it's actually sort of this logic that's been in part of human nature. It's this logic that um, has been around, I, believe, I, I suppose, for eons, where we believe, like, I don't have to be as good as God I just have to be better than you, and then I'll go to heaven, right? Compared to you, 
um, I'm good, but, but compared to the holiness of God, right, I, I'm like filthy rags. So, so they, would, they would answer that, and I would go home troubled, but you know, I would also be troubled on a, very, on a much more personal level because what, what I was telling people was this. I was telling them, you pray a prayer, man, and you are set. You are in. You are good to go. Now, now could that possibly be true? Absolutely. If, if our prayer leads us to, to a, a submissive posture in which we come under the Lordship of Christ. Right? But, but in my mind, even as a 13, 14-year-old, there was this sense in my mind of like, just like, if, if, if I've offended God to that degree, like my sin is so offensive to God that he has this wrath stored up that is pointed, pointed at my sin, like if I've offended God to that, to, to, to that degree, which according to the Bible we have, then like mouthing some sort of prayer is going to make all that go away? So I had this, this, this dilemma in my own life and so I told you a few weeks ago, I would go home. Uh, it was actually a few years before, before this story that I'm telling you, back when I was just a latter, t- latter uh, elementary age. I would go home, uh, I'd be at home and, uh, summer nights, and I would lay in bed, and there would just be this, this, this excruciating mind game that I would go through. I told you about this a few weeks ago, where I'd be like, God, if I'm, if I'm not a Christian, I want to be a Christian. And if, I don't want to go to hell when I die. And I'd be like, if, what, if that, what if that prayer that I prayed there, you know, down on, west of, on East Elizabeth Street, um, that's, that, 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 that winter night, what if, it, what if it didn't really count? What if, it didn't, what if I didn't say the words right? God, if I'm not saved, I, and I'd do it again. And, I, and I'd pray it again. Because in my mind, my pretty logical mind, an ethical mind as, as a young as, as, an older, as an older elementary age kid, like I was like, man, putting that kind of weight on, you know, two or three sentences, man, I better have gotten those sentences right, you know. So, so today what I want to talk about is whether or not we can really have confidence in eternal life whether or not we can actually finally go home tonight and lay our heads on our pillow and sleep soundly knowing that there is this this deep assurance in in eternal life, this deep confidence. And and even going beyond that, uh, that, that is the the ultimate, right? But but added to that in today's passage is there's, there's, there's this sense that we can have an assurance that when we pray, that God hears our prayers and He cares. He cares deeply. That's what we're talking about today, the confidence of eternal life and answered prayer. Let's jump right in and we'll read this passage. If you've not been here before, welcome. Uh, If you've not been here before, we are deep into um, a study of First John, the epistle of John. It's not, it's not the gospel of John. That's way early in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. The same John wrote books at the end of the New Testament, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, these letters, these epistles, dealing with issues, dealing with some problems in the church, and then he wrote the book of Revelation. Um, so we're, we're, we've been studying for, I don't know, six weeks now, 1st uh, John. And uh, you need to know that, that John... Um, if, if you've been here most of the weeks, you know, already know this. But John, he was uh, probably the youngest of the 12 disciples. He was impetuous. He had this nickname, the Son of Thunder. Um, but ultimately, as life uh, played out, ultimately he became, he became known as um, the, the one whom Jesus loved. Uh, Jesus gave his mother, Mary, over to John to, to be cared for for the rest of her life. When he was crucified, um, John was the one uh, who Jesus sent along ahead with Peter to prepare the upper room for the Last Supper. Uh, John is the one in Da Vinci's painting who's leaning his head on, 
on uh, Jesus' shoulder. Uh, John, in his, elder, in, his, in, his, in his elderly state, uh, when he could not say anything else, um, his words had escaped him. Um, church tradition says that he died in Ephesus, that he lived his final days in Ephesus, and they would take him from church to church or from house to house. And he would simply say to them, um, little children, love one another. Little children love one another. He was so elderly that they had to carry him wherever he went, and he only had enough strength to say that. Little children love, love one another. So this whole book is, is, is about the love specifically in the church that we have one for another across the aisle and across the chairs. And um, with that, let's read. Let's, let's, let's jump right in. We're, we're, going, we're going to the very... Uh, the, the latter part of the, the, this, this first epistle of John now. We've, we've, we've moved through much of it. We're now in chapter 5, and then we're going to go back to chapter 3. So we're going to spend time in two places today. But, but the latter part of, of John, chapter 5, and here's what it says. It says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God. Why does he write these things? Here it is. That you may know that you have eternal life. And this is the confidence that we have toward him. That if we ask anything according to, to his will, he hears us. And if we know he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the requests, could also be translated the answers that we have asked of him. The word of the Lord for which I give thanks. So you go to the end of this first epistle of John and you find out his whole point in writing this book. He says the whole point here, I write these things so that you may have confidence so that, so that you may know that you may have God confidence in your eternal state. What's going to happen to you for the rest of eternity? He says, that's why I wrote this. I wrote this so that you would have confidence, God confidence in eternal life and God confidence in his willingness to answer you when you pray. It reminds me of the end of the Gospel of John. Years ago, we as a church studied through the Gospel of John. And do you remember at the end of the Gospel of John, he does the same exact thing. He tells them why he recorded everything that he, that he, that he recorded. He says, like, Jesus did so many miraculous things that I suppose a whole volume of books could be written about it. He said, but I, I recorded these, <clears throat> these things I recorded these things, and here's what it says in the Gospel of John. Now, I've, I've moved to a different book briefly. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name, eternal life and abundant life, abundant living here on earth. So it's, it's, it's John's style as a writer. At the end of the book, he tends to tell you, in case you hadn't gotten it already, here's why I've told you everything that I've told you. Okay, so let me ask you a question. What gets in the way of our confidence in eternal life? What gets in the way of my, my confidence as a little boy regarding my eternal state, whether or not my, my faith in Jesus is authentic? And, and what gets in our way is, is simply the fact that, that I know myself too well. You know yourself too well. John here in the passage we're about to read, he says it's our heart. Our heart lies to us, and it tells us, like, like you, you're, you're trash, man. God, God wouldn't have you. If there, was some, if there was some hurdle that you were supposed to jump over, you can't jump high enough. I don't know why you cleared that thing. What gets in the way of this confident, confidence? You know, when you're, you're looking me, 13, 14-year-old boy in the face, and you tell me, man, I, I hope that one day I get into heaven. I hope that my good outweighs my 
bad. What gets in the way of our confidence is really our, what we call our hearts. Our, our hearts. My heart, it, my heart condemns me. It impugns me. Tells me time and time again of, reminds me time and time again of the things that I've, I've already done in life that I can't fix, that I, I can't change. But in contrast to that, there is this phrase in the, the book that we're studying today, or that we've been studying in 1 John. There's this phrase that comes up time and time again. It goes like this, by this we know. And he says, here's how you know. Here's how you know. Friends, God wants you to know today that you have eternal life. If, in fact, you are a Christ follower. And if, if, if you're not, then God wants you to settle that today. God wants you to know, to have confidence in your eternal state. And he wants you to know, have confidence in the fact that he is, God is working on your behalf. Before we go to the next passage, I want to point something out to you, and that is that, that as we talk about salvation, as we, salvation means you have been saved. Pretty clear, right? Now, if you have been saved, then, there ha- that, then from what or whom have you been saved? And, and in this case, it's the what. It's, and we don't like to talk about this, but I unpacked this a few weeks ago. I don't really have time to do, do it again today. But what we, what, we, what we are saved from, in fact, is the wrath of God toward our sin. We don't talk about that every week, but we need to talk about that some. That God is so holy and God is so righteous and God is so perfect that he hates sin. He can't stand sin. And we wouldn't want it any other, any other way. Imagine a God who, who, who tolerated sin, who didn't hate sin. Who didn't say, I will one day right every wrong. Imagine a God who didn't feel that way. So he's righteous and that he does what's right and that he always ultimately rights every wrong. And so what we're saved from in our salvation is, is the wrath of God, the, the, the punishment for our sin. And, and, and so, in our salvation, uh, before we read this next passage, what I want you to think on is that there is a means to our salvation that is like the source, the source of our salvation. Who does the saving? Do I save myself? I try to if I'm self-righteous, right? If I'm self-righteous, I try to save myself. But but the means, the source by which we are saved, and then there are the the results of being saved, the characteristics. um, And we, it's really important that we keep those two separate. Because just to cut to the chase, you have no ability, my friend, according to the the Word of God, to save yourself. But the result of you being saved, these these characteristics, we we, we call it, you may not like this word, obedience to the Father. That's very different. But what empowers this? What empowers that? It's the same source. We'll talk about it here in just a minute. Let's jump into the next passage in 1 John. Now we're we're in chapter 3. And it says this, By this, here's that phrase, By this we shall know. You might think I'm reading the same passage if you didn't listen really closely earlier. These are two separate passages. I'm telling you the phrase, By this we know, it's all over the first epistle of John. By this we shall know that we are of the truth and and reassure our heart before him. For whenever our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart. Can you repeat that phrase with me? God is greater than our heart. Let's just say that together. God is greater than our heart. One more time. Say that with me. God is greater than our heart. Thankfully. Praise be to God. God is greater than our heart, and He knows everything. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. And whatever we ask, we receive from Him because we keep His commandments and do what pleases Him. And this is His commandment, that we believe in the name of His Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another. Just 
as he has commanded us. Whoever keeps his commandments abides in God and God in him. And by this we know that he abides in us by the Spirit whom he has given us. We have the means, the source by which we are saved, and then we have the results, the characteristics, what it looks like when a person has been saved. All right, so what we're talking about is we can have confidence, God confidence, in our eternal state, in our salvation, and we can have God confidence that God's ear is, 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 is turned in the direction of our, of our prayers, and He answers, and He responds. Let's go through this passage. Go back to the very beginning of this passage, and let's just let skip, point out a few different aspects. We're not going to project these, but a few different aspects. First of all, First of all, it says, just as, as I had unpacked uh, previously, it says that, that, that the problem with our, 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 the, the source, the, the cause, rather, of our lack of confidence is that we turn inward. We become self-righteous. We're like, I'm going to save myself. I'm going to hold my breath. I'm going to do really well. I'm going to do more good than bad. But then what happens is that our heart actually condemns us because it says, it says to me, you know you can't do enough good. You know you can only hold your breath for, for, for so long before you've you got to come up for air. You know you can't do this on your own. The life of the self-righteous pers- person is a life of angst. It's a life of strife. It's a life of public self-confidence followed by, by private um, terror. Because you want, you want to put, put your best foot forward. You want to be better than everyone else. But, but in your heart of hearts, you, your heart condemns you. My heart condemns me. That's, that's what this passage says. But then the next thing it says is that our confidence can be in the fact that God is greater than our heart. And so our confidence lies in the goodness, that would be the mercy, the kindness of the Lord, and in the greatness of our Lord, meaning that He's just, and He's, he's righteous, and he's, he's able to save you. We're going to relook at a passage later on, to, later on this, in this sermon, but, but I feel like I've I got, got to get here right now. I, I, I can't leave this part out right now. What is the source of our salvation? It's Christ's work on the cross. What did he do on the cross? He paid the penalty that I rightly have built up for myself or that I rightly deserve. The, the sin, the brokenness, the ways that I've wronged you, the ways that I've wronged others, the things that I didn't do that I ought to have done, the things that I did that I shouldn't have done, my, my rebellion towards God, all that. I've, I've racked up for myself this, this, this sin debt. And, and, and I mean, I know this sounds crazy if you're not a Christ follower. This is just the ethic of God. And if you're going to follow Christ, Christ, then you should consider this. I know this sounds I know this sounds crazy because we tell ourselves we're not that bad, right? You know, your mama said, like, you got a face, everybody would love you. Uh, and, and, and I, you do, most of you. You do have faces. Everybody would love. But, uh, <laughs> but the truth of the Bible says that we have racked up for ourselves this sin debt. And, and, and so God God, in his, in, his, in his wisdom, God, in his mercy, he, he, did, he did the hardest thing that has ever been done in the history of the universe. God did the hardest thing that's ever been done in the history of the universe. He looked at your sin. He looked at my sin. He said, I can't just forget it. I'm righteous. I can't just sweep it under the rug. I'm not Santa Claus. 
He's holy. He's righteous. He's just beyond compare. And I suppose in a nanosecond or, or shorter, because it, it, um, it doesn't take him time to process things like it does me, but, but God determined to do the hardest thing that's ever been done, and that is, I will send my son to bear their punishment that they might be forgiven. And he did that. That was the hardest hurdle that has ever been cleared in the history of the universe. And now there's this logic that the Apostle Paul lays out in a passage we don't have time to go look at today. And he says this. The Apostle Paul says, He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for you, will he not also give you every good thing? You see, we think, man, I don't know that God, I, I don't know that God would, like, he would do all of that for me. Like, he, he probably, like, reluctantly will do a few things for me. And Paul says, no, that's, that's bad logic. Paul says, if, 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 God, if, if, if God our Father was willing to do the hardest thing that's ever been done in the history of humankind, in the history of the universe, if he was able to clear and willing to clear that hurdle, will he not, will he, the, don't sweat the small stuff, he'll do the rest of that stuff. He will, he will hear you when you pray. So our confidence even when our hearts condemn us, is in the greatness of God. He has made a way for our salvation. He has made a way for eternal life. He has, he has done that. So, so, so the rest of the time today, here's what I want to talk about. So what is, what is our part, our role, our responsibility? Like in the daily grind, what, what are we supposed to do? <clears throat> and this passage says that while the means of your salvation is, is the greatness of God, the, the, the source of your salvation is the great. The result, the, 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 result the, the characteristics of being a Christ follower, here's what you look for, if you're a Christ follower, because even the results, even the characteristics will give you confidence. The results, he says, we will keep his commandments. But then he, he quickly lists the commandments. And, and, and he says, really, he lists two commandments. Did you catch that? He lists two commandments. Go to the next screen. Because we keep his commandments and do what he pleases. Um, and this is commandment that we believe in Jesus, in the name of Jesus Christ. And love one another, just as he has commanded us. Period. You remember Jesus when he was on earth? He had this talk of a, a new commandment I give you. And, and John, because he hung out with Jesus, he's the one whom Jesus loved. He's like the expert. He's the doctor of love. Uh, he 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 writes all about love, and he says two two commandments: believe in Jesus and and, and love one another. Now, what I what I want to know is, well, what happened to the other eight? Like they, don't, they don't even parallel, but what about the Ten Commandments? Or you might, or maybe not, be surprised to know that, that in, the, in the Torah, in the Torah, in the first part of the Old Testament, that there are something like 600 plus rules and regulations that, uh, that are listed. What happened to all that? And then add to all that the, the beautiful truth that John, in, back in, epistle, in, in, in the fifth, uh, fifth chapter of the first epistle, add to that the, 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 the beauty that, that he tells us, unlike any other system of rules, be it 10 rules, be it 600 plus rules, John, the apostle, tells us that God's commandments, his expectations on your life are not burdensome. If you had to follow 600 plus rules, like you had to make sure that you, know, you, you didn't wear any, 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 uh, any cloth that was 
polyester, meaning it was like mixed materials. And you had to make sure not to flip on a switch um, on Saturday because that might be work. And you couldn't pick any, uh, any grain because it was the sap. Like if, if we had to follow, that would be burdensome. That would be burdensome. But, but what the Lord places on you, his, his expectations of you, John says it's not burdensome. 1 John 5, it says this, For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. The original word would have meant like, meant like heavy or difficult or weighty or fierce or even savage. What the Lord expects of you, it's not burdensome. This is the new commandment that Jesus spoke of. See, there is a kind of commandment keeping that can be heavy, burdensome, difficult. And that, those are the, the, those are the, the, that is the way of the self-righteous person. I must, I must do right all the time, and I must, I must keep a record of it, and I must, I must make sure that you understand that I'm doing better than you because I'm, the, I'm on the pathway, uh, on the path of self-righteousness. But if we are saved by the sheer mercy and grace of God, born out in Jesus' work on the cross, then at that point, the result of obedience, John says, that's not burdensome. I mean, you may at times think, man, why does God ask me to do all these things? And, 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 and John says, you know, if it seems burdensome to you, then you may be, you may be missing, the, missing it. You may be, you maybe you don't understand, or maybe you're not, in fact, the Christ follower. Is he saying that life isn't hard? No. That's not what he's saying. Is he saying that what the Lord expects of you isn't burdensome? Yes. That's what he's saying. And so then there's this talk of obedience. Are we saved by our obedience or are we saved by the sheer grace of God? And the answer is God's grace alone. We've been, the early church preached that. We've been preaching that since uh, Martin Luther in the Great Reformation. You were saved by, by the sheer grace of God alone. And now there are these results these, these characteristics, this, this life of obedience that is not burdensome. So why do we talk about obedience? Paul used a phrase, and here's where we're going to kind of spend the rest of our time uh, and, and be done here pretty quickly. Uh, uh, Paul used this phrase, so we're skipping out now on, on John for the rest of, well, we may come back briefly, but skipping out on John now, and I'm going to go to the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul John, they would have known each other. John was a church father. Um, Paul was a rough and tumble uh, missionary, the greatest missionary ever, I suppose. And, and so here's what Paul wrote. And this rocks me every time I, I read it because it, it tends to initially kind of slap in the face, uh, smack in the face of, of, of everything I've just said about the sheer grace of God being our only source of salvation. Philippians 2, it says this, work out your salvation. And it goes beyond that, work out your salvation with fear and with trembling. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. The word of the Lord. Work out your salvation, he says, with fear and trembling. What does it mean? I think it means like ponder your salvation. Consider the source of your salvation. It's, it's a, it is an important question. If it hasn't been settled, to, it is important to lay in bed and, at night and, and wonder uh, who is the source of my salvation. Work it out. He even, I, would, I wouldn't go here, but, but, but he's Paul. 
right under the inspiration of, of the Holy Spirit. So it must be true. Work it out with fear and with trembling. And then he says, like total 180 degree change in direction. For God is working. It, 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 it's a participle in the language. It would have said, God is, God is, this is how it would have been said. God is the working one. God is the working one in you. So Paul says, work out your salvation. Fear, trembling, it's a big deal. Work it out. And then he says, but actually it's God. He's the working one in you. In other words, you can't work it out on your own. God is the working force in your working. If you're a parent or you're an aunt and uncle, you may be able to relate to the story I'm going to tell. It's like when, when my little child is beginning to ride her bike and she thinks she is riding. And she says, let go, Daddy. Right? Let go, Daddy. And what, what, there is no way in the world I'm going to let go because that poor little child will go sprawling across the pavement. It will not go well for her. She is doing the riding. She is doing the working. And I am the working one. In her working. I am the working one. She may forget that at times, but thankfully I don't let go. In your salvation, in the working out of your salvation, and in your obedience to the commandments of the Lord, you are to work it out, and the Lord is the working one. And he will never let go. He will never abandon or forsake you. So here we're confronted with the true meaning of faithfulness in Christian living. There is a genuine working, and yet God is the working one in your working. In confusion, we think that, that the Christian life is merely a powerless <clears throat> but hyper-emotional ride Falling down, feeling bad, getting back up, saying I'm going to do better next time. Powerless. And so Paul calls us to work out your own salvation. Yet, yet there is a divine activity behind your working. There is this infusion of God in your activity. Notice the passage. God doesn't... God doesn't merely work on your activity, work on your obedience. He does not merely keep you steady and true in your obedience. He works on your will. God doesn't merely work on your activity, but he is working in your will and in your working. Changing, here's what this means, changing the desires of of your heart. He's working on your will. He's not just working on your discipline. He's not just working on your activity, on your obedience, on your, your outward appearance. He is working on your desires. He is the working one in your working. And friends, that does not negate or rob from the authenticity of your obedience in the least bit. It supercharges, it makes your obedience effective fruitful. John Murray, a important, uh, I think he was Scottish, pastor, he's dead now, he said this, God's working in us is not suspended because we work. When you start trying to be ob obedient, that doesn't mean, that, let, me, let me just read it back. God is, God's working in us is not suspended because we work, nor our working suspended because God works. God works and we also work, but the relation is that because God works, we work. All working out of our salvation on our part is the effect of God's working in us. By this you know, that's what John wants you to have deep confidence in today. By this you know that God is able. That's the means. 
By this you know that you are now able. The results. By this you know that you have eternal life because God is able. It's the means. By this you know that you have eternal life because you are now able. That is the result because the working one is working in your working. I still sin, Randy. I still sin, Pastor Randy. I, I, I fail, I fall, I trip. Does that mean I'm not really a, a believer? First John chapter 2 from about four weeks ago in, in our preaching, it says this. My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that, that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. He is the propitiation. That means the wrath absorber, the one who, who took on the wrath and, and absorbed it and, 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 and settled it and said what? It is finished. We, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And by this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. There it is again. I'll end on this uh, final passage, 1 John chapter 3. Take comfort in this, dear friends. It says, so what kind, see what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called the children of God. And so we are. Amen.